Well, as talks uh, continue over the need to support more developing countries on climate adaptation, I caught up with resident representative for the United Nations Development Programme in Ghana, Dr. Angela Lusiki. I started by asking her her thoughts on the recent statement by the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who thought that the world was on its way to climate hell. Dr. Angela Lusiki, thank you for talking to Joy News. COP27 is underway in Egypt mm -hmm. and is beginning to elicit some concerns. Already we're hearing from the UN Gen uh, Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, uh, who's made a passionate statement about the need uh, for adaptation when it comes to climate change. And I just want to read excerpts of his speech in Egypt. He says that, quote, we are on a highway to climate hell with our foot still on the accelerator. Humanity has a choice. We either cooperate or perish. What would you say to someone who believes that these statements are exaggerated? I think blessed, and thank you for giving me an opportunity to, to speak. I think that the science is very clear. We've heard from all the top scientists, we've heard even from the World Economic Forum, that climate change is actually one of the outstanding challenges of our time. We've also seen what's happening around us. The evidence is all around us. If you look in the case of Ghana, in the north, we're already seeing droughts, we're seeing uh, erratic rainfall patterns, and reduced productivity because of climate change. And in the south, we're seeing what's happening with the sea level rises and the floods. So definitely, the evidence is all around us, and it is indeed a huge challenge for us. Uh, and of course, uh, COP27 is giving us a grounds to reflect and to go back to 2015, take a look at the objectives of the uh, Paris um, Agreement. Mm -hmm. The objective is to have global warming somewhere around 1.5 degrees Celsius. How close or otherwise are we to getting to that aim? Well, you know, uh, last year in Glasgow, over 197 countries came together to come up with the Glasgow Climate Pact. And there there were commitments to maintain um, uh, bright, uh, uh, temperature rises between 1.5 and, and 2 degrees centigrade. But even those commitments would not leave us anywhere close to where we're supposed to be. So right now, we need to look at a higher level of ambition. We need to look at accelerating our commitments and actions in this area. So we're nowhere near where we need to be, and this is the time to change course. So this is feeding into what some experts fear, mm -hmm. that we may not be able to meet our targets by 2030. Is there a possibility that we may meet or otherwise? Well, right now, and I think the discussion of the COP is very important, because it is clear that we need a commitment globally. The Secretary General is right. We're all in this car, and we're going over the edge together. So we now have an opportunity to revisit our commitments and look at the COP as an implementation uh, framework so that we can increase the technology and resources that are going towards climate change. COP may be underway in Egypt, but uh, the, there are other international developments that may, of course, affect the commitment of current countries when it comes to climate change. And for instance, I refer to the UNDP document on the latest Russian-Ukrainian war, mm -hmm. you're reporting that, for instance, Africa is facing a double crisis where we're recovering from the shocks of COVID-19 and the effects of uh, the war is fast escalating. Are you not having that fear or pessimism that countries, even after the talks at COP27, uh, may no longer be committed looking at their priorities? priority list when it comes to climate change? Indeed, it is true that the world is facing crisis after crisis. And our latest human development report, Global Human Development Report, looked at that and looked at the uncertainty in the world because of the complexity of at least three interconnecting crises, the, the, cost of, uh, the, the climate crisis, conflict, and cost of living crisis. But the good news is that there are things that we can do now that will help us change the trajectory of how we are able to deal with some of these crises. And we are asking countries to do, to put more investment 
into uh, climate mitigation and development, as well as look at strategic innovation and also look at insurance. So we're saying that there are these crises that are happening, but this is an opportunity to help us change the direction of how we can be able to respond to not just these crises, but the ones to come. But practically speaking, mm -hmm. uh, if an, a developing nation such as Ghana is facing these same um, effects of mm -hmm. COVID and, and the Russian-Ukraine war, mm -hmm. you would expect the state actors to tilt towards responding to some of these immediate concerns rather than the mm -hmm. so-called far-fetched issue of climate mm -hmm. change. What would you say to someone who's well, siding with that Well, th this, is, this is actually real because as much as people are looking at the climate crisis as a forward-looking crisis, it's with us now. And although Africa and African countries have uh, made the least contribution to this crisis, we are at the front lines. If you look at the farmers, if you look at the fishermen, if you look at what's happening um, on the ground, these people right now need assistance. Whatever investment that we can make in improving their resilience uh, will also be able to reach our long-term objective. So it's not either or. Actually, investing in climate change, adaptation, and mitigation will help us to achieve all our other goals related to food security and, and, and so on. Very often when the subject comes up uh, around climate change, uh, it's mostly construed to be abstract. How telling are the effects on, for instance, a nation such as Ghana? First, I want to commend um, what the media is doing because they're able to translate these uh, bigger words into what's actually happening on the ground. So climate change is actually very practical because when a farmer is not able to plant um, plant their crops on time because the rainfalls are late or when fishermen are not able to to fish because you know of, of the rising sea levels and so on that is climate change and I believe that the media and our civil society partners have a large role to play in explaining this but also also empowering people to let them know that there is something that they can do when they take care of their environment, when they restore degraded forest areas, then they're actually improving their livelihoods and also helping to deal with climate change. Uh, and we need to draw the economic angle to this, um, the, the feeling that some developed countries are making us here in Africa pay the price for uh, the pollution in the world. Um, what do you have to say on the North and South divide uh, when it comes to issues relating to climate change? I think the African countries at the COP are coming up with one strong voice to change the narrative and to say that this is an opportunity for the world to come together and support the countries that are most vulnerable because we have countries that are on the, on the front line. Uh, we have uh, uh, people living in low-lying low um, island states, people living in, on, the, on the shores who will be the first affected. But they're also offering an opportunity for a solution. And I think that Ghana has been one of the leading countries in saying that we need to have more collaboration and also in be being able to take advantage of opportunities under the Paris Agreement, where they can collaborate between private and public partners to mobilize the resources that Ghana needs to be able to uh, carry out the national determined contributions. So it's an opportunity to ask countries to collaborate more effectively and also offer solutions. So African countries are saying, yes, we need to honor commitments and we're also ready to do the work that needs to happen. In the missing link appears to be the issue about sanction and why we're not able to get the richer nations or the industrialized nations to pay as they pollute. Why is that becoming a difficulty for the international community? I think this is one of the discussions that's going to happen at the COP around loss and damage. And I think the, the big idea right now is to look at the framework for making this happen. We believe that this is an implementation COP where we're asking all the countries come, to come together and honor their commitments, but also to provide solutions. And the example of Ghana is excellent because Ghana has been able to unpack the Article 6.2 in the Paris Agreement and have an agreement with Switzerland for example, to be able to invest in uh, global emissions here in Ghana while trading carbon credits. So I think there are mechanisms that are available for, to take this forward, and Ghana has been a good example of how this can happen through bilateral agreements. And just to pick on that, how will developing nations 
uh, I mean, bridge the gap and, and I mean, get closer to the levels that we've seen in Europe and elsewhere through uh, a more sustainable green approach. Uh, the belief is w we may not get there as fast as we want if we want to go the green approach. Is, is that a uh, feasible arg argument to be putting up at this I point? Think, I think the whole world has to change to a low, low carbon intense pathway. Otherwise, there is no way we'll be able to cut emissions. But African countries now have an opportunity to shift through a just energy transition, for instance, and to be able to grow for the future. We cannot continue to use the same methodologies that have got us to where we are now. And this is an opportunity to invest in that. And this is why uh, the countries coming together at COP are looking at ways where we can not only increase the finance flows, but also technology transfer and also ideas and innovation because it's only together that we'll be able to solve this crisis. So let's talk about funding then because it's mm -hmm. becoming a challenge for many developing nations. How mm -hmm. is, for instance, um, the UNDP supporting developing nations to try and catch up? In the case of Ghana, which uh, we'll be able to talk about more in depth, right. uh, we have supported the government in their uh, agreement with Switzerland uh, under the Paris 6.2. And there, they have been able to mobilize up to 42 million in financing to be able to reach uh, Ghana's own energy um, transition plans. But we're also looking at other ways. How can countries across the continent use their natural resources more effectively to be able to mobilize the kind of financing uh, that can be able to trans transform livelihoods, uh, for example, uh, through uh, the Global, Environment, uh, Global Climate Fund? We've been able to mobilize almost 30 million. That is looking at sheer landscapes and how you can transform livelihoods in that area while restoring uh, the forests and degraded land. So it really is a win-win situation. And I think there are opportunities for this to grow. Uh, and I really commend the work that is being done by the government, as well as development partners and the communities themselves to ensure that this happens. Uh, our, our president, Nanadu Dankwa Kufado, has been speaking, uh, taking his stand to address world leaders. Mm -hmm. uh, he's um, coming from the point where uh, we should be considering a debt swap for countries that are embarking on the adaptation journey. Uh, is that an option that we could explore in the international community? I think this is a welcome suggestion. And if it is implemented, it could result in resources flowing more towards the kinds of actions that we need to transform livelihoods and, and also um, enhance structural transformation because now we will have more uh, funds flowing to development activities. But what's more striking about that is that truly the reality is that African countries are struggling to invest more in, into these areas, the, the, the green agenda. Uh, it's become a challenge looking at um, the predictions, for instance, from uh, the UN, which yeah. says that many countries will be in a debt crisis by next year. W what proposals or recommendations are there for struggling nations on, on how they could try as much as possible to find space for the green agenda while they deal with the tight economic challenges? That is a very interesting question. I think it looks at the dichotomy. Investing in green and renewable structural transformation will actually help to advance all the other agendas. One example is energy. Looking at green energy will be able not only to help our SMEs, to be able to, to function better, but also taking care of our environment so the future generations will have the same opportunities as we do. Uh, I guess technology will also be another hurdle, mm -hmm. right? Or you feel that there's, a, there's an option or a way out for us? This is precisely one of the, the, the points I made earlier. Mm. At the COP, we'll not only be looking at financial flows, we'll also be looking at technology, partnership and collaboration. So the most important thing to look at is how we can bridge that gap between public and private collaboration in order to move the agenda forward. It's not something that the government can do on their own, and it's not something the private sector can do on their own. Uh, I'll just um, turn our attention to what, what it is that other organizations have been saying about Ghana and how compliant we have been when it comes to preserving our natural resources. The World Bank, through its uh, country and climate reports, is indicating that Ghana, for instance, is becoming uh, too reliant on our natural resources for poverty reduction 
and job creation. Uh, this should be uh, of worry to you as well at UNDP, isn't it? Well, actually, to your point, I recall that uh, in July, the government came up with its voluntary national review of progress made towards the Sustainable Development Goals. And we did acknowledge that there's been significant progress on, on poverty reduction over the years. But in the recent, due to the crisis um, and the complex complexities of the crisis that are, are continuing, we now have a challenge with uh, multidimensional poverty and inequality. So the problem still remains. And natural resources are, so natural resources are something that is an asset and an opportunity. Um, okay, so is it the case that we need to diversify what we have as, as a natural resource? So natural resources are an asset. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing is how do, you t how do you turn your natural wealth into national wealth? So once the proceeds from natural resource extraction are utilized for human development, social progress, then that becomes uh, the basis for continuing um, the journey. So diversification is definitely important, but you have to vest invest effectively in using your natural resource as well. Uh, most of the times we're, we're focused on government and authority just to deal with this, uh, the impact of, of climate change. Uh, what can citizens around the world also do to participate in that process? The first thing citizens can do is to hold their leaders accountable. There are significant and ambitious commitments that have been made in the national determined contributions and that is something that is for all of society and all of government to implement. So not a single sector, all the sectors working with the communities, working with the civil society, working with the private sector and the media is the only way that that can be uh, implemented. We're also looking at livelihoods and opportunities for people to be able to grow um, their enterprises um, sustainably and that is a choice people have to make. But in what practical ways can they mm -hmm. participate in, in that exercise? Well for example I'll give you an example of what's happening in uh, in Chebi working with the local communities to preserve the forests and reforest these areas. They're also setting up seedlings, community seedlings where they can be able to continue this, this work. But most importantly, we're looking at community resource management. How can the community come together with the leadership to be able to conserve their resources more effectively? So the community has a role to play, and we should leave no one behind. And I'm sure that as UNDP in Ghana, you have a series of um, events that have either taken place in the past and that you're seeking to capitalize on going into the future. What are some of the programs lined up uh, which you intend to uh, implement to push that green agenda? We'll continue working with the government to support uh, the Article 6.2 uh, implementation and we're happy that with the experience of Switzerland we see other partners coming on board, for example Sweden is coming on board. We also see opportunities to continue growing the work that we're doing under the Green Climate Fund which has just started, um, that covers the five northern, northern regions. Also the work around restoring the cocoa landscapes. There's a lot that still needs to be done and we look forward to more partnerships to be able to take this forward. Ghana as a country is beginning to revise its uh, targets uh, in terms of our national determined contributions. Uh, how worried or otherwise are you looking at the fact that we're beginning to shift positions on, on how committed we are towards dealing with uh, the challenges? Um, from what I know, the nationally determined contributions uh, were presented last year uh, to great fanfare. And now we are at the level of turning that ambition into action. And it's very good to see the movements that have been made to engage with the private sector, because it's very important to have this collaboration between the public and the private sector.